at Women's Health Goulburn Northeast, we recognise the importance of conversations to drive change and foster understanding. In an ever-involving world, pausing to reflect and engage in meaningful dialogue is essential to shaping our shared future. We hope that you will enjoy tonight's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce Tammy Atkins, who will uh, navigate us through this evening's conversation. Uh, Tammy will in turn introduce our guests to you. Um, now, Tammy has a bio that we I could certainly read, but one of the things that I want to say is what a delight it is to work with Tammy, who um, dives into everything with amazing enthusiasm and has such a curious mind. So I am really thrilled to have her um, here this evening uh, to be hosting our panel session. So please join me in welcoming Tammy. Well, hi everyone. It's lovely to lovely to see you all. And there's some familiar faces and some new faces, both in person and online. And it's just lovely to be here. We will be your entertainment for the evening, and there won't be any singing and dancing. But there's going to instead be some really lovely conversations about collaboration and partnerships. Perhaps a little bit about taking going from ideation right through to action, and about working with community and working with other stakeholders to really make make a difference out on the ground. So. I'm looking forward to the learnings and the tips and perhaps some of the warnings as well as they, all advice would be appreciated. But without any further ado, let me introduce our extraordinary panel of uh, people tonight. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, firstly, Lee Collar. Lee hails from Golden Valley Health Public Health Unit and she has a decade in health promotion and prevention of chronic disease, focusing on partnerships to up uplift regional wellbeing. With a focus on and a passion for community health, she addresses systemic challenges, championing healthy lifestyles and equal opportunities. It's sounding pretty good so far, Lee. And through a strategic lens, she understands the pivotal role collaborations play in determining the future of our rural and regional communities. So please join me in welcoming Lee to the panel. Dr. Adele Modolo made it up the Hume today, and we're so grateful that you've come and you've joined us for this evening. First time in Benella, so um, I think I'm pretty sure she's going to come back, which is great. Adele is the CEO of the Multicultural Centre for Women's Health, Victoria's leading organisation dedicated to the health of migrant and refugee women. And one of the many projects she's been coordinating is the Women Project, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about tonight, and which has been working with rural and refugee women to provide health education in over 20 languages, including with women in communities in Wodonga and Shepparton, so in our region as well, which is pretty exciting. Please join me in welcoming Adele. And Dr. Rowan O'Hagan, who many of us will already know, uh, Dr. Rowan O'Hagan is a regional economist currently working in rural health research. She holds leadership roles at Northeast Health Wangaratta and Albury Wodonga Health, and she's a passionate advocate for regional Australians, having co-founded several sustainability and women's empowerment initiatives, many of which I think some of us here in the room have been part of. So Rowan, thank you for joining us. So this is how it's going to work. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to speak for a little while, talk about their background, provide some advice and some learnings for us. Then I've got one specific question for each panellist. And then we've got some questions overall. Then we're going to throw to the floor and online and we'd love your questions and perhaps some of even what your learnings are and your collaborations, because there's nothing better than conversations and dialogue. And that's what really makes Women's Health Goulburn Northeast quite special, I think. So, Lee, I'm going to hand over to you. Please tell us all about partnerships, collaboration, and some of what you've learned over the years. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for the invitation, Amanda. It's a real honour to be uh, amongst um, some a group of fabulous women and people online as well. Uh, I, uh, it's wonderful celebration of 30 years um, of women's health. And so also I'd uh, like to congratulate them for uh, that achievement as well. I think as uh, the president chair uh, stated, you know, we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. So um, it's great to be here. So my uh, background, as uh, Tammy said, is uh, 10 years in uh, health promotion and uh, 
prevention, doing a range of things. I did study um, economics. So, you know, um, I've got that um, somewhere back a, a few years ago now, but um, my, I originated with the primary care partnerships and some of you would be familiar with uh, the primary care partnerships. There was 28 of those across the state uh, over 20 years. And um, as their name uh, states primary care partnerships that's pretty much what we were built on uh, very there's a few of us a few people in the room who were quite closely connected and particularly in regional uh, Victoria really valuable because as we know we can't do any of this alone and we certainly can't do it as an individual um, and we can't do it as one organisation. It's so important to have um, partnerships and uh, what was achieved in the primary care partnership years was um, the partnerships. In You've got small amount of resources. We might've had um, three or four part-time staff and a full-time staff member and um, yet we could achieve a lot because we had such fabulous partners. So um, uh, for 10, uh, under 10 years, the primary, I worked with the primary care partnership and uh, more recently, um, the last 18 months, the primary care partnership work transitioned over to the public health units. And there's nine of those across the state. And interestingly, I, at first I thought, oh, what, what, how sitting under a hospital is this going to be helpful, um, you know, for prevention? And um, I have found that um, hospitals are, um, do have and are paid for um, a providing service um, when people are uh, unwell and yet health promotion and prevention is so important. Um, we prefer that people weren't using the hospitals. So it's a bit of a, um, a, a hard task. But what I did realise is the public health units were actually set up during COVID uh, and they were in response um, with contact tracing, uh, providing information and vaccinations. And the Department of Health realised it couldn't do that for Melbourne and manage such a large scale um, uh, health issue. And so that's uh, when the nine uh, public health units were set up and um, and it was their regional connections, their partnerships that um, helped throughout that pandemic. It was their connections. It was uh, everyone worked tirelessly. I think um, I have shivers when I think of COVID times. However, um, that was the beginning of the public health units. And as they transitioned out of, uh, responding to COVID, um, they brought um, in this health promotion and prevention arm, which is really exciting. Uh, and we've been working on a strategic plan, um, a population health plan, a catchment plan uh, for the next six years and endorsed by the GV Health. And, it, and it's a real shift for them because it, it is about uh, prevention of chronic disease. It is about health promotion and um, it is about partnerships. So um, again, we have a small team and it's not going to be the small team in public health unit and it's not going to be GB Health uh, that helps our communities wellbeing. It's going to be um, everyone as a collective. We have to, as we know, um, for the people in the room and all the walks of life that we're part of, it's all of us together that are going to make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lee. Yeah. That was great. Adele, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Tammy, and um, thanks so much for inviting me here. I'm really, I've really enjoyed my life here. Um, we went and had a lovely walk on the lake earlier today, so it's um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, so, Multicultural Centre for Women's Health is Victoria's statewide um, migrant and refugee women's health organisation. Uh, we've been going for 45 years this year, so we set up in 1978. Um, so, uh, Women's Health uh, Goulburn North. Northeast is um, we're middle aged, and you guys are just like really, you know, um, kind of young <laughs> at the beginning. Um, so we um, are run by and for migrant and refugee women, and uh, we run a whole ho host of um, different programs. One of them, and that's our was our kind of um, very first program that we had, was um, delivering in language education to migrant women in factories in the 1970s, late 1970s, um, about contraception. So what we found at the time was that migrant and refugee women didn't have the information they needed to make um, kind of informed choices about their reproductive health, um, didn't know what contraception was available to them. So we trained up a team of biological health educators and they um, would go to workplaces during lunch breaks and live that um, education information to migrant women so they could um, take better control of their own reproductive health. 
Um, one thing that I've learned uh, over the years in this role, I've been in, in at MCWH for over 20 years now, is that we couldn't do the work we do without partnerships, without collaborations, uh, without really active engagement with um, other organisations. Um, and the the best partnerships or the best collaborations are when you're really clear about what you bring to the table. So we know that um, we've got a specialisation in migrant and refugee women's health and um, we love to partner with other organisations that bring something different, you know, that there's um, something that we need. So with um, Women's Health Goulburn North East, that specialisation in rural women's health, um, that enables us to have a partnership where we're both really clear about what we bring to the table and that combination of what we bring to the table um, is the really important thing. Um, we we work a lot with um, workplaces. So even quite unlikely um, organisations, you can actually partner or collaborate with or um, even if they might be just very short-term collaborations, um, we still work with uh, factories um, and we still go and visit women in their workplaces where migrant women are employed. And one of the things we find um, is that we go in, we deliver education about a whole range of different topics, um, including family violence. And um, that's been the one issue where we've had so much engagement from employers themselves. So we hear, thank you, from women, you know, that they're um, experiencing family violence or they need support for family violence and we're able to um, refer them to where, uh, you know, they really want to go for services. But then we work with the employer. And what they often need are policies, what they often need are referral services. You know, they can often pick up when there's an issue in the workplace and they just don't know what to do. So um, that's also a fantastic engagement with workplaces. Um, and we've had so many um, fantastic discussions with HR people and other um people in workplaces where they want to do what's right for their employees um, and and that's also something that we're able to work together with them on. So sometimes you find your collaboration in the most unlikely places who would have thought. Yeah, definitely would say that uh, without collaborations, none of us would be able to do our jobs. Goulburn Valley Health, so a regional organisation, a statewide organisation. And now, Rowan, you've been involved in some national um, initiatives in the women's empowerment space, sustainability. Tell us a little bit. Gosh, you're putting me on the spot. And it's like you've got a relay um, baton there, so we could do a run later. It's a mega one. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks again, again to everyone for um, the privilege of being here tonight and being part of this wonderful panel. Thanks to Women's Health and everyone here for coming along. Um, yes, yeah, so I've worked uh, in research as a researcher for several decades. I started in agricultural research and then um, got interested in rural communities, um, women in agriculture, rural business and farm business and the impact of uh, climate change on communities. And over that time, you know, my research interests and my social networks actually sort of m melded together and I found that that's been a fantastic way to, to live and understand my, my place in the world and my place in the community. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, evidence, but I might maybe talk about that a little bit later. In terms of the organisations that I've been involved with, um, is Australian Women in Agriculture is one of the um, is the peak organisation for women uh, in agriculture in Australia, and it's been going for nearly thirty years now as well. Started in nineteen ninety four, so my involvement there was very much about um, thinking ab about the disadvantage and the social isolation that women in agriculture had, and the discrimination in the workplace. Um, both in family businesses and in other parts of agriculture. Uh, and that was born very much as a feminist organisation to um, to empower rural women to take their rightful place in their, in their industry. 
Um, in terms of sustainability, I've been involved in um, the Wangaratta Sustainability Network and the Northeast Regional Sustainability Alliance. And again, it's another situation where you could see that um, there was action that needed to be taken and there are willing people to who were keen to get together and take that action. And uh, that's been going for quite a few years now as well. And again, it's it's a it's an opportunity for people to be connected in their communities and take action in their own space and place. Thanks, Ron. Uh, that was just wonderful. Now, I'm going to ask questions to the panel and uh, please, once you've spoken, dive in and we'll make it a conversation here. But, Lee, I'm going to go to you first. And you mentioned, uh, you talked about change, going from the, the PCPs to the public health units, just the world's constantly changing, as Amanda um, said earlier tonight. How do you see consultation or community collaboration changing in the future? Is there, Are we going to have to change the way we engage with communities, the way we engage with our stakeholders? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> I don't think this was the exact question that I had no. to answer, but I, I like what you've got you, you on the spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've pushed me a bit further to think, but um, um, one of the um, important things uh, of partnerships and collaborations for me is uh, the voice of others. And as Adele uh, rightly mentioned, everyone brings a different skill or a voice or an opinion, um, whatever it might be. And I sense there's a change in that. Um, uh, I'll give you an example for uh, for me, the Royal Commission into Mental Health and the lived experience voice and the valuing of lived experience in, in the space of mental health. Uh, that's been a really, um, and that's a partnership with people um, with lived experience and making sure that they're part of that conversation. And I don't know, look, and there's, of course, there's always, it's never a smooth path, you know, um, there's talk about paying people um for their voice, which is very important, but in a rural um, setting, then uh, where you have um, community groups who are advocating or whatever, what about them? Shouldn't they be paid? So anyway, it's, of course, it's never quite as smooth um, as that. But I do see that shifting, uh, that value of the lived experience voice, um, particularly um, people, if you're, if you're addressing a particular health condition or whatever it might be, if it's um, mental it health or whatever, you to have that voice, I see that partnership with um, those community organisations and those um, people really shifting um, uh, from where you would, yeah, and, and often it hasn't been valued in the past. That That's just my thinking and that question. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, definitely. Voice is such an important one and that's how we make decisions. It's how we, you know, understand what's happening for people in the world um, and I guess the important thing is to uh, is really making sure that we've got equitable mechanisms for different voices to be heard um, especially people who are marginalized and um, it, with the the group that we work with with migrant and refugee women it's often very complex getting migrant refugee women's voices to the table because length of the language barrier um, but it, yeah, it can be done um, and it needs to be done. So um, I think, yeah, really wanting to hear that diversity of voice um, around the table. Rowan. Thank you. So I was going to say in, in relation to um, evidence-based practice where we there's sort of three aspects of it. One is the scientific evidence. The other is the perspective of the clinician or the practitioner and of course the other then is what the consumer preference is and what and that's where I think the um, increased highlighting of lived experience and and where consumers can when I use the term consumers I mean you know pa patients clients whatever um, community members um, their contribution can be just so much more um, significant and I think that has been quite a major shift over the last period of time to, br to bring that um, voice to the fore, something we're certainly um, working very hard on in the health sector. 
um, the acute health sector um, to you know bring bringing the consumer focus into everything we do and into our research as well. The other thing I think that needs to, as I said, it, it doesn't always. The systems have to be there to support those voices, and um, it often there's power imbalances and those sorts of things. And you know, because I'm not involved in the acute, it, um, you know, even in the development of new programs, initiatives, or those systems have to be in place to support those voices. And um, you know, there's work to be done um, on that. But I think that's where where um, where we can really improve. Thanks so much. So we're going to see some dynamic and innovative models, I guess, and approaches moving forward. Adele, I've got a question for you about the Women Project. Now, that kind of stands out as an, a beacon of inclusivity, and you've been rolling that out statewide, which must be a monumental effort, but also can here in she sorry in Shepparton down the road and then up in Wodonga as well. Can you give us some examples of how that project's making a tangible difference to the lives of uh, refugee and migrant women in our region? Sure. So I love the Women Project. Um, it's a statewide project that WH has been running with seven of the regional women's health services and Goulburn, um, Women's Health Goulburn Northeast is one. Um, so basically it's a program where uh, bilingual health educators are recruited and based within uh, the women's health service in local areas. And then MCWH plays a role in training those educators um, using this accredited course that we have. So it's a very comprehensive course and um, it really supports uh, trainees to understand how to deliver health education in your language on a whole range of issues. Um, the Women Project, when it first started out, was also a COVID initiative. Um, so we started out training all the health educators on how to deliver um, COVID information to communities. And the reason for it was because those communities were really missing out. So um, for anyone who lived through COVID, we know that migrant communities were um, disproportionately impacted by COVID. They had lower levels of access to vaccinations, were less likely to be vaccinated, more likely to be infected for a whole range of reasons. So the Women Project was initially set up to um, just cover COVID. But um, along with COVID, we also trained educators up to deliver additional information. Um, and that was really important because you you often go to a group and say, look, I can give you some information on COVID. And they say, I know everything about COVID, um, even if they don't. But if you're there to deliver a, a kind of program of information about issues that the women themselves have told you they're interested in, then you can weave COVID information in, into it as well. So that's what we did. We trained up educators and then those educators went out and did two different types of activities. One was community engagement. So it was really about going out and getting to know people in ethno-specific organisations or other multicultural organisations, letting them know what we can deliver. And then the second activity was actually delivering health education. So on a statewide level in 2022, um, we reached over 3,000 women across the state um, through 162 sessions. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of that. But what did Women's Health Goulburn Northeast? Where are you? I've got the number for Women's Health Goulburn Northeast. Oh, here we go. Um, so Women's Health Goulburn Northeast delivered 15 sessions. Um, and they worked with 282 women from six different cultural groups. So almost 10% of the whole statewide um, kind of number was at Women's Health Goulburn Northeast. So that's a phenomenal job. Um, they, what did it achieve? It achieved some amazing things. So I can give you a case study um, that was provided to me from um, the staff at Women's Health Goulburn Northeast. They did a, a program with a group of 16 women and out of the 16 women um, who hadn't yet been vaccinated, 12 of them after the session did go off and get vaccinated. So that's amazing. And not only that, 13 of their children went off. And I mean, so they went and um, arranged vaccinations for 13 of their children. 
Um, so a total of 25 people who otherwise would not have been vaccinated had the information they needed to make an informed choice about whether or not they would be vaccinated. Um, but there were also some secondary outcomes. So for us with that program, that was the main game, but the secondary outcomes were also really important. So not only did they receive health information in their language on COVID-19, but they also knew where to seek information on other topics. So even if they didn't need breast screening or even if they didn't need menopause information at that time, they knew where to go. They knew to go to um, the staff at Women's Health Goulburn Northeast. The women developed a better understanding of the health system. So some women were saying that, um, you know, they didn't realise that you could get an interpreter just to have a vaccination and they, they learnt that. Um, there was also something that is really difficult to quantify, but an increased trust in the health system. Um, they made an important link with a trained bilingual health educator from their own background who speaks their language, who is also a part of the health system. So that's a really an important step in engendering trust and understanding and familiarity with the health system. Um, so yeah, I think that there's some amazing outcomes. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I guess running it locally and having local people deliver the program as well, there's that added trust from that. Yes, absolutely. That's the key. So as a statewide service, we've, we've got our own team of educators and we would always just go out and deliver. Before the Women Project, we'd, you know, link with the Women's Health Service, but then our educators would go out and deliver. But the benefit of having a local team is unquantifiable. You know, they're local people, they understand the issues you can have an ongoing relationship with um, people in the community. So I think that's really the key to um, successful programming. And that's a great segue to my question to Rowan. Rowan, the principle of nothing about us without us. And can you provide some examples where that local evidence base, that local research has really come through and created fabulous programs that have been really inclusive and involved people in community? Thanks, Tammy. So um, I'm I'm going to go back a little a little way, and um, it's not necessarily um, health research, but the example I um, really like to think about is the um, farms, which is the farm and rural mobile services for children. And this particular uh, program arose out of a, a tragedy where um, a, a toddler fell out of the um, tractor cab and was um, killed while um, while uh, working on the, working on the farm because uh, there wasn't any childcare so the imperative to get out there and get things done but unfortunately it resulted in um, an absolute tragedy so this is in the early early 90s we're talking here but um, so the local women got together they uh, received some funding to, to do a need study on um, childcare for farming women. And they put that together. We, we had a steering committee that went for nearly seven years before we actually moved from, from that research that we did to um, getting the program funded. But that, that program then um, extended over quite a large area across uh, northern Victoria and into the Riverina, and it ran for 22, 22 years and provided um, mobile childcare services in local halls. The other th there was talk about spin offs. Um, the, then there was a program on doing up the local halls because they were using, um, they were being used for childcare and getting them up to speed with uh, health and safety and things like that. And, and then it's extended to all other types of um, uh, long, long day care as well as um, education programs. So the benefits to those families um, from an economic point of view for uh, enabling the women to work on farm, but also for the families, the social um, interaction and the early learning for those children was just huge. So for me, that's an, an example where um, a group of people can see a need, they can do the research to get the evidence that they can then um, take that and lobby and advocate for funding. Now, the, th those types of services still happen all, all over Australia. It actually wasn't, it wasn't the first one, but it was certainly the first in our region. There, there are 
a network of those across remote Australia. But unfortunately, the funding for that particular program was um, uh, finished up. We had a, a member for social services who, uh, sorry, a minister for social services who um, wasn't really interested in delivering social services. So um, it, it is a shame. But I think it is a great example of um, r rural women getting together and um, seeing the change that they wanted to see. Rowan, with the networks and the collaborations that we have at the moment, and I guess the, the changes in technology, we're all a lot more connected nowadays. Do you think it would still take seven years to get a project like that up and funded nowadays? Uh, possibly not. We, we did have to do a lot of travel up and down to Melbourne, which we probably um, wouldn't have to do now necessarily. I had to... Um, make sure that I had a breastfeeding child that I could um, pop out and breastfeed at the appropriate times so that the bureaucrats could understand uh, what, the, what the need was. Um, and so we did have to have a few props, but nevertheless... Um, <laughs> look at... Oh, yes, it was definitely my child, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I th well, I don't know. It depends. Um, we do have a much broader range of funding programs at the moment, but also the you know the funding is competitive. So, yeah. Well, oh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I'll throw this to anyone on the panel, but collaboration is often hailed as the secret to success, to getting something up off the ground. But it does come with some challenges, whether it's having to find procure a, a breastfeeding child at the last minute or <laughs> find some props, do the right lobbying to the right person. Can you each share a moment where a partnership or a project faced a significant obstacle and how you collectively navigated in order to, to make that project come to fruition? <laughs> Do I have to go first? I told you tonight would be wild. Yeah, it's going crazy. Um, it was funny when I saw this question, um, we did have a little heads up of a few of the questions that might be asked, and um, it got me thinking, oh, God, it feels like an interview, you know. Tell me a time that you learned, you know, something from a mistake or a, you know, challenge or whatever. Anyway, so I did ponder this one. Um, I, I mean, I, I just find partnerships and collaboration is so frustrating and yet so rewarding. It's, um, I, I love, that, that's how I do my work. I wouldn't, I, I don't think I could do it any other way. But um, one that sprung to mind, which is really uh, a little bit controversial, but well, it's sort of, um, we'll throw it out there, is when we're in the 16 days of activism um, against gender-based violence, uh, which is a campaign that runs uh, in November and December, We've had an um, amazing collaboration of um, oh, between 10 and 20 organisations um, for the Murrindini and Mitchell Shires over the last four years, and uh, they're into their fifth year. Um, and we do an evaluation every year, and we did decide we wanted to include men. And, um, you know, that really threw up. And here we've got Rob in the room and our two cameramen, and, uh, you know, speaking of... I was thinking of this example and thinking of this very thing. Um, and, you know, because we talked about... Um, as we said, partnerships, it, uh, we need everyone to be involved. And so we talked about how do we get men to, uh, how do we encourage and invite men to be part of, you know, even um, talking about gender equity and, um, you know, family violence. And um, we had, you know, it, it was a really challenging conversation for, um, and it was really interesting because I don't think we'd ever considered how do we get men involved in the you know, gender equity, and I think, and it challenged a lot of our assumptions, and we, we were really fortunate because there were some men who stepped up, um, you know, a little thinking, well, I'm, I haven't been involved in violence, what do I know? And I'm like, well, I haven't either, but what do I know? And, um, you know, but they were really courageous and they stepped up, but I did find we, we in our, during some of our meetings, um, you might remember, we realised that actually we were very exclusive we had this sort of conversation and language and, and a way to speak and what was right and what wasn't. And I, and I think um, some of the feedback from the men was that, um, you know, we weren't being... Like, you know, I think our way was the right way and if they said they were worried that they might say something wrong and we really um, pondered that for quite some time in terms of how do we deal with this? Is You know, we've got a great partnership. We've got, 
you know, but we're coming across really strong. So we've had some good conversations, but I think there's room for more. You know, how do we, um, um, you know, make sure there's a common language and, um, and even though we think we've got the right people around the table, um, are we excluding some people and um, that we don't even realise we're doing it? Uh, so, yeah, just, a, just an interesting uh, challenge that we had um, in that um, I don't... Uh, I haven't been around the table this year. I'm not sure if there's any males, but um, it might be like you, Rob. There might be a um, thank you for coming tonight um, and being the representative <laughs> male in the Women's Health Club of North East AGM. It's great to have you here. I don't know if you want to add anything on that one. Um, yeah, look, I, yeah, I, I, up on the men question, I think um, it is really important for men to be involved in preventing violence against women and um, obviously gen promoting gender equity. Um, I think we need to do it in an evidence-based way, so really be guided by what the evidence is telling us because there is always that risk, I guess, of doing harm. So um, one of the things that we, in the migrant refugee women's space or in the, in the multicultural space, there is that stereotype about migrant men being, say, more violent than other men or that culture causing violence and things like that. So I think we really need to develop some guidelines and strategies and ways of actively engaging men making sure that we're continuing to boost the leadership of women in communities as well. Because, you know, men, I mean, they're lovely. <laughs> but <laughs> they, <laughs> they are lovely. But, um, you know, they can, in a conversation, sometimes, um, you know, we, we, we tend to focus on them. We tend to centralise them. We tend to prioritise them and their feelings and their, and their needs. Um, whereas for this issue, we really need to continue to prioritise women and centralise women and our needs because it's we're talking about violence against women. We're talking about gender equality and, and women are the ones who are oppressed. So, um, so I guess just to, to say I'm all for it and I really think we need to do that work to make sure we're doing it in an evidence-based way and in a way that does actively engage men in a positive way um, and that has the effect that we want it to have, the impact that we want it to have. Um, so just on the, the tricky question um, in partnerships, I, the one that I wanted to mention was um, sometimes, you know, we get lots of requests from researchers. So, um, Rowan, it'd be interesting to hear what you think about this, but... Um, so researchers in universities will often develop a research project and they approach us to do one little bit of it. So they'll say to us, you know, we want to interview migrant women about, you know, perhaps their, their experiences as seasonal workers, for example. Can you get the women for us so that we can interview them? Um, and maybe you can run the interviews in their language or whatever. So they've got a little component carved out for us, which... You know, I mean, that's great. It's better than us not being involved at all. But um, we actually want more. We actually want to be involved in setting the research question and we want to be involved in collecting the data and we want to be involved in analysing the data and we want to be involved in writing up the, the research because we've got this specialist expertise that we want to be woven in throughout the whole project. So um, I guess it's just about then how do we kind of build that in from the beginning of a project where, when we're coming from two different places? So academics are coming from a particular way of doing things that historically, you know, has always been the way. Um, and, you know, coming to a place where we're both kind of speaking the same language and um, finding the funding as well, because funding's limited. Um, there's not always that funding to be able to share between two organisations or three when you're working in partnerships. So, um, yeah, I find that really tricky, just getting on the same page with people. But the strategy, I guess, is to start that conversation at a really early point in that partnership and build it in and work together before you actually um, kind of get to that point of applying for funding. Rowan, have you seen plenty of this? The yeah. Look, I think that's very um, valid 
point, Adele, and it's something that we know um, our Aboriginal communities have to deal with all the time. Um, our Rural Health Commissioner calls it the seagull effect, where you just fly in and, you know, steal the chips and then fly out again and leave nothing but a little pile of guano on your way out. <laughs> so um, what, one of the um, aspects of my role as, a, as the Rural Health Academic Network Coordinator, um, funded by the University of Melbourne, is actually to be embedded in, in the hospital and, and in a rural area. So I think that goes some, some way to, to um, assisting with that because we are, we are members of the community and we're, we're um, always working to find out what, what our local community needs and, and how we can work with them. But it also reminds me um, with our current... Um, conversations about the voice to parliament um, takes me back to something that happened in Australian Women in Agriculture um, quite a few years ago, actually, 1997, when the WIC um, decision came down and the Howard government decided that they would um, uh, amend the Native Title Act with their with their 10-point plan. And it was a little bit like the conversations we're having some are having at the moment that, uh, you know, the, the voice is going to be going to come and steal your land. Uh, we're going to be um, taking over your backyard. And uh, my sister overheard someone the other day saying that it's actually they're going to come f and take our super as well. So I'm not quite sure where that, that leap came from. But uh, back in, um, you know, the native title um, amendment issue... Um, there, there was a lot of concern amongst pastoralists and farmers about um, how it would impact them and their farm businesses. And um, there was quite a bit of hysteria out there. And so Australian Women in Agriculture decided that it, they had a role to play in having a uh, sensible um, conversation about it. And they brought together the president of the CWA uh, the president of the Foundation for Australian Agricultural Women and the president of Australian Women in Agriculture with um, s some prominent uh, Indigenous women representatives of the community and they had different um, breakfasts and discussions in different states around Australia just to try and um, uh, diffuse the situation and have, have a conversation between the people who, who actually had a stake and who had an understanding of what the situation was. And um, I think that was a, a way of um, a collaboration that actually was um, very valuable then. Still didn't necessarily solve the problem, but it just gave people an opportunity to share their views and understand each other's perspectives. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you, all of us. Before we go to the floor, I've just got one quick question, if I may. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> one question, if I may. Well, it's quick from my end, if I may. Um, I want to explore the concept of rurality and intersectionality. And like, we're, we're all really complicated people. How do we have to, how do we take that into consideration when we're out there collaborating, when we're forming partnerships? It's a little bit different out in the country. We're constantly, we hear that, we're told that. Is it and why is it that bit different and what do we need to be doing that's slightly different to how projects may roll out in the city? And Rowan, perhaps I'll, I'll throw that to Can you. start with me? Mm. OK. Um, I'm just going to consult my notes. <laughs> um. I guess we've got those different elements we need to think of in the rural areas here in, in Victoria and across Australia. but. Also, there's intersectionality at the same time. Yeah. So um, one of our sayings in, in rural health is actually, we use the expression, if you've seen one rural town, you've seen one rural town. <laughs> so in other words, don't, don't presume that all communities are the same. And um, there are communities that get over-researched, you know, that some people, um, they're the flavour of the month and everyone wants to come in and talk to them, but um, 
At the same time, I'm thinking of the, um, you know, the Care Through Disaster Project that Women's Health Goulburn North East. There's, there's also um, very much a place for actually allowing people to ha have the um, space to talk and have their voices heard. So I think, um, I think it depends on the situation, but I think never, never assume that everybody is, is the same. And there are definitely different factors in rural um, communities to metropolitan communities. And some of it is about um, con confidentiality and uh, different power dynamics. And some of these things take a little while for people to, to understand and it's the, often the local people who can um, help researchers and people wanting to um, assist in health promotion and prevention who the best people are to speak to. Thank you. Would anyone like to add to that? Uh, rurality, um, you know, I've grown up in small country towns and um, I live in Alexandra now, which is an hour and a half from here. And um, uh, you do know everyone and everyone knows everyone. So it is exactly as you said, um, Rowan, that um, we, we sit in meetings um, uh, where people, uh, sexual reproductive health nurses or youth workers say, you know, kid, uh, young women don't want to go into the doctors for the morning after pill or, you know, because they know the doctor and the doctor knows the family and then it's, you know, or they don't, um, uh, you know, so people, everyone knows everyone so that confidentiality can be, become a real issue in um, uh, women's health uh, and, um, and access to services. <laughs> Naomi and I have talked about this at length on many topics, um, access to services is one of the biggest um, um, health issues for um, rural uh, people in general, let alone rural women. Um, and we don't have transport. I live in Alex, there's one bus a day to um, Melbourne or um, one bus a day to Seymour. Um, you know, and then there's small surrounding towns. We do have a great hospital and a great um, a number of um, rural hospitals that do provide a number of great services. But there's people in the rural areas that can't even get to the local um, hospitals um, uh, in a timely manner or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, there's uh, accessibility is a real um, issue that I've noticed, um, and <laughs> sometimes a little outdated. Um, ideas. I went to the doctors and um, I was talking about menopause and the doctors just looked at me and he wouldn't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, maybe it's to do with menopause. He's like, I think we'll just check everything else. Oh, okay, sure, no worries. <laughs> wouldn't even talk to me about it. So, you know, and that could be anywhere. That could be in Metro as well. I don't know. But, um, you know, certainly. And then you're limited with, with the doctors that you get to see and if that's their opinion. Um, and then, you know, no matter um, what gender or, or intersectional, um, you know, challenges that you face, um, yeah, there can be some very um, set opinions and then you don't have a lot of choices outside of that. So... That's what I wanted to add in terms of rurality, um, adding to um, uh, some of our complex challenges. You think when you on the rural? I think no. I, I don't think I'm very qualified, um, but um, I love to learn from my rural <laughs> colleagues, and um, yeah, I, I really appreciate to lear learning more. And it really un underpins that whole focus of your organisation, having those collaborations and those partnerships across the state. So you've got that place-based work. We'll throw it out to the floor. Do we have any questions for our esteemed panel? Don't all rush at once, oh. all right? Now, now it is Amanda, so it will be ready. <laughs> How are you going? <laughs> any questions? I've got the roving mic. Thank you. Um, uh, following on from something that you mentioned, Rowan, about one of the organisations that you've been a part of being a feminist organisation, uh, Women's Health Goulburn North East is also a feminist organisation. And I suppose we can probably have a whole panel about discussion about what that means um, in terms of objectives, but also the way the organisation runs and exists. And But my question is, 
to what extent uh, in the panelists' experience, um, there's probably varied experiences to working in a feminist organisation per se, but to what extent you've collaborating with organisations that consider themselves to be feminist organisations is different to the alternative and ca can collaboration be harder when there is, I suppose, a philosophical, that philosophical difference or perhaps it's not, perhaps it's not, um, or to what extent that that, that issue arises? So, I'm first. Okay. I think there's def definitely an advantage for um, when you're collaborating with other organisations that have the same purpose and the same ethos. Um, but, and so often you can make quite good progress quite quickly. But in some ways, you really need to be working with the organisations that need, need to um, improve or, or often are seeking some assistance to improve and, um, and to broaden their perspective and to provide um, better services or better um, membership for, for women. Um, so sometimes it might be a little bit Com more comfortable to actually work with, you know, your, your sister feminist organisations where actually you might be better off, um, you know, challenging the, the status quo in some other organisations. Now, obviously, you've got to be, um, you know, choose carefully because um, you might be just banging your head against a, a brick ball. But um, a lot of organisations, particularly in agriculture, have um, moved quite a bit over time and a lot of the time they're asking for assistance and support on, on how to do things better. And that, so that's to be encouraged. Um, thanks for that question. I think it's a really good one. Um, it reminds me of a project that we were running um, a number of years ago. We ran it for about three years, working with multi-faith organisations or with faith organisations to prevent violence against women. Um, and so, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of very different faith organisations coming from very different starting points. Some of them aren't known for their feminist kind of philosophies. Um, so when we do that work, part of the thinking is, you know, can we get somewhere? So we know we're not going to get where we really want to get, but can we get somewhere? So there's that thinking, you know, do we think that there's, you know, good, is it um, worthwhile investing some resources into getting to a different place, um, even if we're not going to get where we want to go? But then I guess alongside that question is, is there a risk of doing harm? Um, and so that's also a, a you know, question that we need to weigh up alongside, um, you know, can we make some progress here? Um, sometimes we get requests to provide, um, so we do in-language education on a whole range of issues, including sexual reproductive health, and we cover the whole range of issues. Um, and sometimes we do go to temples and um, mosques and, and other um, kind of religious um, entities because that's where women gather, so we do outreach. Sometimes they'll say to us, we'll have the, the women's health program, but can you leave out the abortion bit or can you leave out the... Um, and so in those circumstances, um, we really try and push the envelope and say, look, it's a whole program, we can't leave out any part of it and really try to... Um, because uh, I guess that's an example of where you could actually do harm. If you're delivering a women's health program to a group of, of women, you're their only way of finding out the information and you're leaving out... You know, you're kind of talking about preg this is how you get pregnant and all the rest of it, but you're leaving out that re very important... Um, piece of information that actually you don't have to continue with the pregnancy. Um, so we have in the past decided not to go ahead with that program, um, leaving that information out. So it's really that weighing up um, 
that we do. I probably, like you said before, I don't have experience working in a feminist organisation, but I can say, um, similar to what um, Rowan was saying, is that um, I do find when you when you do bring organisations together like Women's Health and uh, you get such good, um, rich experiences and you, you do... It's it's exciting when you get to um, see some shift in an in an organisation's values um, because of what you stand for, um, and uh, yeah, so um, and some very archaic <laughs> um, uh, value systems. But you know, that's that's our job is to bridge the gap with with everyone and uh, as best we can really, so that we can see change um, for everyone. So yeah, thank you. It was a good question. Great question, thank you. And I am conscious of time and I hope you'll just indulge us a little bit longer. Do we have any further questions from the floor or from online, Amanda? Be courageous. Not a problem. What I'd like to do is to finish with our panel, could you each please share a key takeaway or a learning, something that really underscores the power and the need for collaboration and partnerships in order to get us to gender equality out in rural and regional Victoria? I think um, on reflecting on this one, for me, it is similar to what we were saying about values and for me, partnerships and collaborations about heart, you know, no matter who you're collaborating with, whether it's a human, um, a human an individual <laughs> or a, um, an organisation, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a collective of, of humans and they have hearts and you, when you partner and collaborate, you know, and sometimes they're very different to you and you do have to listen deeply like any relationship and, and whatnot. But that's, I, I was sort of thinking, what is it really for me? Why do I partner and collaborate? And it is to try to really deeply listen to someone and, and understand where they're coming from and why why they think like they do. Um, and that for me would be the biggest thing is, you know, if we can if we can do keep doing more of that, which I know everyone in this room does and, and you know, we all love human connection um, and that's I think you know when I think of partnerships in my workspace that is what I'm trying to achieve is how do I connect with someone and, and how do I help organisations connect um, and help to bridge those differences. Um, I think the the what I want to say here is about the power of the local engagement um, which is why we would partner with rural organisations. We, we can't do that bit. We don't know what's happening um, in local areas. Um, but two really important examples, I think, where as um, kind of urban, you know, being located in an urban area, where we can really learn from rural services are in... Um, with environment and climate, like the rural um, organisations and people are really on the front line of that, that issue and um, we can really learn from, from that um, and it's really important that we do. Um, and the second thing is really food systems and I guess they're related um, because, you know, people don't really understand where their food comes from um, and it does, you know, like obviously the, the um, farming is so important but not only that, it's just like the, the industry that sits all around farming and um, the, the, the way, I mean, I'm not articulating it very well um, but I think that's just something that um, we really need to be able to understand better um, because, you know, with um, d disasters happening more frequently, um, uh, you know, people, cost of living um, crises and food security is going to become a much more important issue for people. Um, so that's their two issues that I'd really love to be able to kind of um, learn a bit more and partner a bit more with regional organisations. So... Um you mentioned, Lee, about um, being connected and that was probably my m main takeaway. But, um, you know, research has shown over the years that the most successful communities and the ones that are going to have um, more resilience to s these climate um, changes that we're going to see are the ones that are, have a high degree of trust and also a, a high sense of belonging. And I think probably um, that, the, again, the Care Through Disaster Project highlights this 
as well. And f so there's, there's that uh, human connectedness and, and that trust. But I think there's also the opportunity for different sectors to um, collaborate more closely. And I'm thinking um, about, uh, in particular, Indigo Power, which is a, a company that came, grew out of the desire of the Yakandanda community to um, tackle climate change and become 100% renewable. Um, they provide uh, retail electricity services, but they also partner with, um, in the Upper Murray, with the bushfire recovery and resilience projects, large infrastructure projects to provide batteries and uh, power and that resilience in, in the face of future disasters. So that's probably an unlikely, um, you know, connection between those, those farming, farming communities um, in the Upper Murray and an organisation like Indigo Power. But in fact, they, you know, it's a, it's a perfect synergy and a perfect connection. So the, my takeaway is about is that building up trust, but also, you know, looking at, at different sectors looking perhaps a little bit outside the box as to what we might, how we might connect and build that, that power. Thank you very much, uh, Leah Dell and Rowan. It's been a really wonderful conversation and I think I'm gonna take away that uh, connected communities are resilient communities, but every community is different. So if you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. Hence the need for those partnerships, those collaborations and to keep going out and, and, and talking to people and listening to people, more importantly. Whilst that brings our panel to a close, it certainly doesn't stop our conversation. So the dialogue, the learning, that all happens, and it happens through Women's Health Goulburn North East. So the panel's finished for tonight, but the conversation will keep going until we all come back here again next year for next year's AGM. So thank you very much for joining us. And on behalf of us, I guess we'll just say thank you to, and congratulations to the Women's Health Goulburn North East team on 30 years. Pretty impressive work. We look forward to seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan, Adele, Lee, and Tammy. Uh, I just, the, the reason, um, I, I guess, that um, you all came to mind for this evening is because of the partnerships, because of the way that you all, you all work. And um, I, I think, you know, Ella was reflecting, Rowan, you were one of the first people to reach out to me when I started in my role. And um, so that was wonderful to understand some of the things that were happening in the region. Um, Adele, um, as one of the other 11 women's health CEOs, we've, we've, you've been an amazing support. And I think that's part of partnerships as well, is, is listening to each other and supporting each other. And of course, working more closely with the Women Program has been fantastic, so thank you. And, and Lee, you've been to our community of practice. When I first started, the PCPs, I couldn't have done my job without the PCP. I, I just found it was amazing to connect in. And so um, I think it was the day after you started at the public health unit, I get a call from Lee saying, "So how together?" <laughs> it was it was great. So so thank you all for this this evening. It's been just really wonderful. We have a small gift for you, a token to say thank you. These are all from uh, women-owned businesses in our region. Um, so thank you very much. And um, so let's around. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>